Well, today, uh, I'm really excited. We're beginning this brand new series, Studying Heaven. And you know, Jesus came, he ministered, he died, and he rose again. And when he rose again, he was raised into heaven where he has taken his place at the right hand of God. And one of the reasons that Jesus went to heaven is that he told us he is going there to prepare a place for us. So we're going to spend some weeks talking about this amazing place, heaven. And I, I think that it's very popular to talk about heaven in our culture right now. And when the culture decides it actually likes a biblical topic, it inevitably does not get that topic right. Uh, it doesn't disclose all that the Bible actually says on that topic. So I want to begin my thoughts today with a true story. This took place in Charlotte, North Carolina. It took place in January in the year of 2000. The leaders of that city in Charlotte invited their favorite son, Dr. Billy Graham, to a luncheon in his honor. Well, Dr. Graham declined the invoca invitation because even in the year 2000, his health was declining. Uh, we know that he is with the Father today, but um, at that stage, he wasn't doing that great. So. Um, they told him, listen, we, we want you to come. We just want to honor you. And, and, if, and if you find any strength at all, just maybe a few small remarks, nothing big at all. So he agreed. And he came and he heard many nice and very deserving things said about him. And then he stood up to make a few remarks. And he began by mentioning that the occasion reminded him of a story about Dr. Albert Einstein. Time magazine in the year 2000 had actually named Dr. Einstein as the man of the century. And some years earlier, Dr. Einstein had gotten onto a train in Princeton, New Jersey, and the train pulled out of the track, and a few miles down the road, the conductor started making his way down the aisle to, to punch people's tickets that were uh, passengers on the train. And when he got to Dr. Einstein, the, the great scientist kind of reached into his vest pocket, but there was no ticket, so he started looking in his pants pocket and there were no ticket there. And so he's looking in his briefcase and he couldn't find the ticket. And the conductor said, Dr. Dr. Einstein, it, it's, it's really okay. I, I, we know who you are and we know that you probably purchased a ticket. So uh, it's, it's, it's very okay. And so he, he started going down the aisle and, and getting other passengers tickets and checking their tickets. But uh, he looked back. And there's Dr. Einstein on his hands and knees looking under the seat. So he comes back to him. He says, Dr. Einstein, really, it's okay. We know who you are. And he stood up and he said, young man, I know who I am. But the problem is, I don't know where I'm going. And I think there are, there are really three great questions in life. Where did I come from? Why am I here? <coughs> Where am I going? Now, secularism answers the first question, where did you come from, like this. You are sophisticated pond scum. You are a complex germ that evolved over billions of years. And if you accept that answer, then that has disturbing implications for the other two questions. If you are just a complex germ, then you have no purpose for being here. And you're not going to go anywhere but just become extinct when you die. Anthropologists have yet to find a single culture, either in our past or in our present, that has not believed in an afterlife. They might call it nirvana. They might call it the happy hunting ground. 
But there is something in our human spirit that refuses to believe. I'm just a candle. And when it's puffed out, there's nothing left. There's a reason our spirit innately believes there is an answer to the third question. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes 3 verse 11 that God himself put eternity into the hearts of men. The Bible says that you were made by God. That is where you came from. The Bible says that your purpose for being here is to live for God. That's why you're here. And the Bible says when you die, you will go to meet God. That is your destiny. Your destiny is an encounter with God. We are all going from here to eternity. That is why we're beginning this study of heaven. And whenever you begin a study of a subject in the Bible, the very first thing you do is go to the Gospels and read the red words. Because you always start a study by asking, what did Jesus say about this topic? And the reason that I believe Jesus has more weight to give on this subject than anybody else is because he has a reason to say he knows what he's talking about. Because a lot of experts that are out there are wanting to give us an answer to that third question. But Jesus is the only one who actually has gone to the other side and come back and told us what we can expect. There is a, a statue in Columbus, or in, uh, a statue of Columbus in the city of his birth in Spain. And at the bottom of the statue of the great explorer is uh, an inscription with three Latin words, ne plus ultra, and that literally means no more beyond. And for centuries, that was the motto of the country of Spain. They believed for centuries, literally, they were the edge of the inhabited earth. There was nothing beyond Spain. But then the year 1492 came, and Columbus got in a ship, and he sailed, and he proved there is more beyond so the lion at the bottom of the statue of Columbus is eating that first word, nay, in Latin, no. There's more beyond. In, in, in the same way, Jesus rose on Easter Sunday from the dead as a way of saying there is more beyond. All men will go from here to eternity. Not Everybody in Jesus' day believed that, though. He actually had secularists that he had to deal with as well. They were called the Sadducees. You see, the Sadducees believed that when you died, nothing happened. You just ceased to exist. There was no resurrection. And one day they tried to trick Jesus. And they came up with a preposterous scenario. They said... A man got married, and that man died, so his wife married another man. And then that man died, so she married another man. That went on seven straight times, and then she died. And they asked the question, whose wife is she in this resurrection? Jesus would not have any of their nonsense, so he shot right back. Look at his answer in Mark 12. Jesus replied, Are you not in error because you do not know the Scriptures or the power of God? When the dead rise, they will neither marry nor be given in marriage. They will be like the angels in heaven. Now, about the dead rising, have you not read in the book of Moses, in the account of the bush, how God said to him, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob? He's not the God of the dead, but of the living you are badly mistaken. You see, Jesus gave two different reasons why 
Men cannot answer the third question. Either they don't know Scripture or they don't know the power of God. Jesus knew both. And he strongly urged that men live their lives in view of the next life. That we would, that we would look through this life with the lens of eternity in mind. So, for example, if following Jesus would make your life harder, it is worth it because of what comes next. Look at Matthew chapter 5. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. And, and if following Jesus brings you great joy, remember the time that he sent his disciples out on a mission and they came back and they were really excited. They said, Jesus, this was awesome. We, we preached and we healed the sick and we, we cast out demons. And Jesus responded in Luke 10, Do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Maybe one of the best known things Jesus ever said was in Matthew 16. This is why you should look at life through the lens of eternity because he said in Matthew 16, verse 26, and what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? Is anything worth more than your soul? You see, Jesus did not preach the gospel of life enhancement. That was created by the American church. We preach a gospel of, well, come to Jesus and he'll meet all your needs. And we teach you how to be consumers. And the job of the pastor is to try to keep all the consumers happy. Jesus did not preach that. Jesus did not guarantee that if you followed him, you would have an easy life. He guaranteed the next life. And he said... You're going here to eternity, so you need to live like that right now. Now, that could be an entire series. I could do an entire series just on what Jesus said about the next life. But I'm, I'm going to sum up his teaching today in three different statements. And the first is this. Jesus was very clear that everybody will be raised and judged. Physical death is not the end of your existence. Every human being will be raised from the grave and has a court date in the future, and there will not be any excused absences. Today, if you have a lot of money, if you've got a lot of influence, then you can kind of push off your date in court. But not this one. Everybody's going to be raised. And everybody's going to be judged. Look what Jesus said in John chapter 5. I tell you the truth. Whoever hears my words and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be condemned. He has crossed over from death to life. I tell you the truth, the time is coming and has now come when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in Himself, so He has granted the Son to have life in Himself and He has given Him authority to judge because He's the Son of Man. Don't be amazed at this. For a time is coming when all who are in their graves will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done good will rise to live, and those who have done evil will rise to be condemned. Jesus told many parables that the future age is going to be inaugurated by a, a universal judging. So you look at all these different parables of Jesus. There's the, the sheep and the goats, the good fish and the bad fish, the, the wheat and the tares, the foolish virgins and the wise virgins. There is going to come a great judgment to inaugurate the next age. And not only did Jesus say that judgment is coming, but he said there's not 
a third group. There's only two. You are either in this group or you are in that group. And a lot of people are going to be shocked at the verdict of their judgment. Matthew 7, verses 21 through 23, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? And I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evil doer. Now, I've never had it happen to me but I do know some friends who have had the great misfortune of being a victim of identity theft. And it is a tremendous hassle trying to get all of that straightened out with bill collectors and, and credit card companies and banking institutions. And, and, and the folks that have had that happen to them want the individual that did that to them to stand before a judge. And they want the judge to say to that person, you are guilty of wearing a name that you had no right to wear. You were pretending to be somebody that you're not. And this is the deal. Jesus says, one day you are going to stand before the great judge and he knows who you really are. And some of you will be shocked that day when the judge says, you wore a name you had no right to wear. You pretended to be somebody that you were not. The judgment will be fair and it will be very clear. And not everybody will go to heaven. But everyone can. You see, the second thing that Jesus was very, very clear about was this. Anybody who trusts him will be welcome into heaven. Jesus' view on life after death was controversial, but it was consistent. He never wavered. Jesus said that our eternal destinies hinge on our relationship to Him. Look at John 6, verse 40. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in Him shall have eternal life, and I will raise Him up on that last day. You see, the great question on the day of judgment will not be, how much did you sin? That's the mistake that we all make. Being good is not good enough to get you into heaven. I want you to understand, nobody goes to heaven because they are good enough. The question on the great day of judgment will not be, how much did you sin? The question will be, how much did you trust God's answer for your sin? Look at John 8, verse 24. Unless you believe that I am who I claim to be, you will die in your sins. The best known verse in the Bible. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. God loves the whole world. But only believers go to heaven. Only people that believe that Jesus is the Son of God have eternal life. So the question is how much do you trust Jesus? Jesus said in John 14, don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust in me. There is more than enough room in my father's home. If this were not so, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? When everything is ready, I will come and get you so that you will always be with me where I am. Now, we're going to talk a lot about this in future Sundays, about what heaven is going 
to be like, that, that great Christian song, I Can Only Imagine. Well, we can do more than imagine when it comes to heaven because we have some very clear indicators of what our future home will be like. Jesus said that there are many rooms. In other words, heaven is a place of community. I, I have had people tell me that they don't like coming to church because they don't like being around a lot of people. <laughs> what in the heck are you going to do when you go to heaven? You need to get used to worshiping with lots of people because heaven is a place of many rooms. Jesus also said that he's going to prepare a place. In other words, heaven is a place. A concrete place. You are going to be raised a physical, tangible body. And you're going to live in a place. And I'm going to talk more about that in future sermons. But, but listen, Hollywood has done no favor for us when it comes to heaven. Every time Hollywood does a, a movie about heaven, heaven is some kind of like a fog bank. You're, you're not going to live in a fog bank. You are not going to live on some cloud somewhere in a white robe. You're not going to have wings strumming a harp. You are going to have a resurrected body. And you're going to live in a place. But Jesus also says, I am coming for you. You see, heaven is a place of unique identity. He's coming for you. We're not going to be genderless clones in heaven. He wants you, your personality, your uniqueness. The thing that makes you, you, is what Jesus is taking to heaven. Jesus said he's coming for you so that you can be with him forever. So this is the most important thing. Heaven is a place of unlimited capacity to fellowship with God. Isn't that what we want most? Do you know that is exactly what you were made for? You remember, at least you should, deep, deep down. There was a time once when, when God walked with us in the garden. That, that's how close we were. There's, there's something deep in the soul of every person that yearns for that kind of, of fellowship with God. There's a neat story. A little boy is flying a kite. It's a cloudy day, and his kite is way up there. And, and he's holding the string, and, and this man walks up to him, and he says, What are you doing, little boy? I'm flying my kite. He looks up. So I can't, I can't see it. How do you even know it's there? He said, because I can feel the tug. And you, you know what? That's how I know heaven is real. Because I can feel the tug of heaven on my, my heart and in my soul. And, and the older I get, the more that I feel that tug. And Jesus said, Anybody who trusts me is welcome there. It is the most inclusive invitation ever made. But it's also the most exclusive. You see, Jesus also said, I'm the only way. There is no other way. No one gets to the Father. No one gets to heaven except through me. All roads do not lead to the same place. Jesus said that our eternal destiny hinges on our relationship with Him. So the third thing Jesus was very clear about was this. Nobody who rejects Jesus will escape hell. And one of those stories that Jesus talked about the sheep and the goats. He said in Matthew 25, verse 41, then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. 
Did you know that Jesus spoke more about hell than anybody else in the entire Bible? And, and I think the reason for that is this. Jesus knew, unlike anyone else who ever talked about it, what God forsakenness was. Jesus is an expert on hell because he's been there. He's done that. He used three metaphors over and over to describe hell. One of them was darkness. And the meaning of that metaphor is that hell is going to be a place of total isolation. One of the most asinine things I hear skeptics say is, well, when we all get to hell, we're going to have a big old party. I used to love this song, ACDC's Highway to Hell. It's all about going to hell and having a big party. You're not going to do that. Because if you go to hell, you won't know that anyone else is even there. Hell is a place of eternal loneliness of the soul. He also used the metaphor of fire. Now, we can debate if this is literal or not. What I do know is that you do have a literal physical body when we are raised, and it makes sense to me that you are going to spend eternity physically, not just spiritually. But the point of the metaphor with fire is that hell will be a place of great discomfort. And one more metaphor, gnashing of teeth. And that is a sign of self-reproach, of remorse. You're driving too fast. You look in your rearview mirror and you see some flashing lights and you go, that's that sense of, oh no, I should not have been doing what I just did. That sense of regret, putting your teeth together, realizing hell is the ultimate expression of God's high regard for the dignity of humanity because... He's not going to send anyone there. See, the misconception that people have is this. This is the pushback that people say. How could a loving God send people to hell? God doesn't send people to hell. God has a high regard for our dignity as people. He has never forced us to choose Him, even if that means hell. C.S. Lewis wrote that there are only two kinds of people in the end. Those who say to God, thy will be done. And those to whom God says, thy will be done. All that are in hell chose to go there themselves. God does not send people to hell. That, that word people, by the way, is, is another misconception. How could a loving God send people to hell? People, it, it means like people are just neutral. People are innocent. Nowhere does the Bible imply that innocent people are ever condemned. People do not go to hell. Sinners do. The rebellious do. The self-centered do. So how could a loving God send people to hell? He doesn't. He simply honors the choice of a sinner. If God forced you to love him, then he would be less than love. <coughs> so if you, if you want to keep your distance from God, if you live your life saying, God, stay back. Not so close. God will honor that for you on the day of judgment. It really is your choice. So the question it boils down to is what are you going to do with Jesus? They tell a great story about Calvin Coolidge when he was vice president. He presided over the Senate like the vice president does. And uh, there were two particular senators that got into a heated exchange. And one of, one of the senators pointed at the other and said, you can go straight to hell. Well, the 
The one offended senator turned to Calvin Coolidge, who was the vice president, and said, Did you hear that? He just told me to go to hell. And Coolidge picked up his Bible. He said, Well, I, I study the rule book, and it says you don't have to. You don't have to go to hell. Because here is something that you can know for sure. No one in hell will ever say, God put me here. You see, God put hell on His Son so that you wouldn't have to go. It's not so much that, that people get cast into hell, but that they get there on their own when they walk by the cross that God put in their way so they wouldn't have to go. You see, your sin will be judged, but God has, has granted you the dignity to choose where you want your sin judged. You can choose to have your sin judged on the cross in the person of the substitute Jesus, or you can choose to have your sin judged in hell. But God gives you that choice. And if you choose hell, you will not spend eternity blaming God, but yourself. No one in hell will say, God put me here. But you know what? No one in heaven is going to say, I put myself here. Our first glimpse of God, His holiness, His purity, His righteousness will drop us to our knees in gratitude for this God that has made a way for a sinner like me to be able to be in heaven. It is grace, amazing grace, that allowed me to be in such an amazing place. Now, I look forward to learning so much as we journey in this topic together. And I'm thinking for some of you, though, you, you really do need to answer this one question. What does it matter if you are right about heaven? You know the right stuff, but you're wrong about Jesus. The first thing is to decide that he is indeed the son of God. And you need to allow Him to be your Lord and your Savior. So my encouragement, let's go back to this story I started with. Billy Graham, he's in Charlotte, North Carolina. He told the story of Dr. Einstein. And after he told that story, he said, Did, did you notice the suit that I'm wearing? My family tells me I've become a bit slovenly, slovenly in my later years. So I, I went and uh, I bought this new suit just for this occasion. He said, I'm going to wear the suit one more time. That's it. He said, the, the suit that I'm wearing is the suit I've chosen to be buried in. And so, should you see me again in this suit, you can know. I indeed know who I am. And I also know where I'm going. I hope you know those things. I want you to stand up. We're going to sing a song right now. And uh, I want to encourage you. If you've got a